starts right now. COVID-19 hitting especially hard among local first responders. Not only are they treating patients, but now several agencies are dealing with their own internal losses. At least three local agencies have lost members to COVID-19 in recent weeks. And as Katrina Weber reports, the deaths come at a time when numbers had been on a downward trend. A flag at half staff outwardly shows the pain felt within San Antonio fire stations. It's in response to news of the death of one of their own. Engineer Joseph Fonts died yesterday, the result of complications from COVID-19. He's one of three local first responders recently to fall victim to the disease. The San Antonio Police Department's Park Police also made an announcement on Facebook yesterday about the death of nine-year veteran officer Jay Pena. He had worked as part of the core unit doing community outreach. Both agencies issued public statements saying the men will be sorely missed and sending prayers to their loved ones. Earlier this month, COVID-19 also hit home for the Bear County Sheriff's Office. Ronald Butler, who worked as a courthouse transport deputy, died at the age of 56. They are among more than 4,300 people in Bear County who have lost their lives to the illness. But their deaths come at a time when there appeared to be a downward trend in reported cases and hospitalizations locally. The Bear County Sheriff's Office has announced that services for Deputy Butler will be held tomorrow morning at 1030 at Community Bible Church on Loop 1604. No services have been announced yet for the other two first responders. Reporting near downtown, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Happening this week, Metro Health will start administering a COVID-19 booster shot at the Alamo Dome. This starts on Wednesday, and the city says you cannot get a booster shot at that location until then. In the meantime, the Wonderland of America's mall reopened its booster shot clinic this morning. A reminder, this is only for those who are eligible and received the Pfizer shot for their previous doses. You also must be 65 years or older or 18 and older with underlying health conditions like diabetes, obesity, or you work in a high risk environment. In New York State, some 70,000 unvaccinated health care workers must get vaccinated by today or lose their jobs. Teachers in New York City have to get the shot this week, too, or they could be out of a job as well. ABC's Dan Lieberman has the latest. Booster shots are going into arms across the country after the CDC recommended them for medically vulnerable Americans, including seniors, those who work in high-risk occupational settings, and immunocompromised individuals. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to get the booster. These are just for Pfizer recipients. If you received a different vaccine... We haven't forgotten you. If you've gotten Moderna and J&J, &J, we will, with similar urgency, address um, boosters for those populations, as well as um, looking at the science and data for for mix and matching. The next phase in the country's vaccine rollout involves kids ages 5 to 11. Pfizer expects to submit data for regulatory review in a matter of days, with authorization expected as soon as the end of October. The dose would be about a third of what adults get. If they approve it, we will be ready with our manufacturing to provide this new formulation of the vaccine. A priority is still inoculating an estimated 70 million eligible Americans who remain unvaccinated. We're trying to do the what is at the best interest for our families. The majority of the nurses that I have spoken to that remain unvaccinated are sticking to their guns. Tricia Sebastian is among 72,000 health workers in New York who face a midnight deadline to be vaccinated or risk losing their jobs. There's a similar mandate for New York City public school employees. A judge has put it on hold, but Asia Levystone would rather lose her job than get the shot. I'm going to be terminated. It's going to be my last day. New York Governor Kathy Hochul is preparing to bring in extra staff, even the National Guard, should hospitals need the help. The mayor of New York City says there's an army of vaccinated substitutes ready to take over city classrooms if they're needed. Dan Lieberman, ABC News, New York. And one treatment for COVID-19, monoclonal antibody infusions. And an office right here in Shirts is the coordinating hub helping to get this treatment to people across Texas and Louisiana. More than 5,000 people in Texas have received monoclonal antibody infusions over the past year from mobile infusion squads operating across the state. There are now 45 mobile infusion squads being operated by BCFS, Health and Human Services Emergency Management Division. 
We have full visibility, command control, coordination, and comms with all of our operations across the field, uh, every state, every type of mission, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, everything from operations to the planning section, to finance, to logistics, as well as uh, we have critical information systems. The number of infusions began climbing in July and are now up to more than 100 a day, totaling 5,276 since December of 2020. In other news this noon, happening today, CPS Energy will hold its monthly board meeting and they'll discuss what to do with half of the seven acres of downtown real estate they own. Originally, CPS Energy was going to give half the land to the San Antonio Museum of Art and the other half CPS would sell. Now the utilities chief administrative officer says things have changed since the trustees first decided to give away the land back in 2015. In 2015, we we're in a very healthy financial condition. Obviously now we are facing challenges. We have customers with more than $100 million in, in payment arrears that need help. Uh, we have challenges um, with, the, with the winter storm URI outcome. Lewis didn't provide an estimate on the market value, though county appraisals put the location at about 11 million per half. And good news for bookworms, the San Antonio Public Library is completely doing away with overdue fines. Starting on October 1st, the library will no longer charge overdue fines for material, materials returned late to the library. The library hopes that getting rid of overdue fines will help break down financial barriers to access library services and resources. Those who currently owe library fines will still be responsible for paying their fines. You can reach out to your local branch to discuss payment options. And a reminder for you, September is Hunger Action Month. Now through the end of the month, you can drop off donations at Randolph Brooks Federal Credit Unions. They're accepting non-perishables like cereal, beans, rice, even diapers and pet food. If you would like to donate, we've got all the information for you on our website. Just go to ksat.com. And local blood banks and hospitals still need more donors to come in and roll up their sleeves. That's why we have teamed up with our KSET community partners to encourage people to donate blood. One donation can save up to three lives. If you would like to donate, you can make an appointment at universityhealthsystem.com or you can call that number on your screen. That's 210-358-2812. An active pattern kicks in this week. We could see some pockets of heavy rain. The latest forecast coming up. And the Spurs holding media day today at their practice facility. We'll hear from some of them coming up. And the Bear County Sheriff's Office wants to see if you have what it takes to be part of its SWAT division. How you can give it a try this week. And do you think you have what it takes to be a member of the SAPD SWAT team? Well, you'll have the chance to prove it in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, the SWAT challenge is back on October 16th, and Max Massey gives us an inside look at what you can expect. Under. Hey, 58 in, 238. So I was mentally and physically getting ready for it. Four. Edwin Rinza is one of the recruits taking the morning to test to see what he's got, all in hopes of becoming part of SAPD. All six. One. Help my community out. I want to be able to uh, be able to say to my kids when they're older that, um, you know, that did something productive in their life. This course will be open to the public on October 16th for the SWAT challenge. So we're having this event to, to promote physical fitness, to answer one of our most frequent uh, recruiting questions that we get, you know, how do I join SWAT? This course is challenging and it's really fun, but it also means a lot for recruiting. There's been different challenges, but people know that they want to work for the city of San Antonio. They want to serve this community. There's something about San Antonio that's still interesting people, and we're just out there getting the information as much as we can. That's why this event's going to be pivotal for that. It's going to be a very good event for the public to put it, you know, put it front and center. Obstacle after obstacle. You will take on the competitive SWAT team. We're gonna have a lot of teams ready to go. Uh, a couple things, uh, it is teams of four. If you don't have a team, no worries, we'll place you on a team. Teamwork makes the dream work. As for Edwin, he has some advice for anyone who's interested. Keep practicing and never give up. If you have any questions about the event, we have those answers right now. Just head to ksat.com. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. That course is no joke.
Too bad they don't have like a desk job for SWAT people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that, I guess. I guess you got to be in shape to be. Yeah, you got to do all SWAT, of the above. Right? Wow. That's what the job. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a bad day to be out there, you know, sweating a little and working out, huh? It's a pretty nice morning. We, we've gone through a really good stretch of weather, and now everything's changing. We're flipping the script here because this week is going to be active. We think we'll get some showers and storms and maybe some heavy rain. We need it. The aquifer is down half a foot today to 657.6. In your pollen count, everything's low, so it's good news there. Molds are low, ragweed, fall elm also low. We'll look ahead to these rain chances and let you know how much rain we think we'll get coming up. Here's yeah, the good thing about sitting right next to the weather department. You can hear them talking. Yeah, about the forecast, and you can like sneak a peek at some of the <laughs> graphics that they have. And you have a good seat. I saw some like uh, some rain possibilities coming up. I'm like, ooh, this could That's be good. good. News. Yeah, meteorologist Sarah Spivey and I were like really digging into the forecast because <laughs> it, there's a little bit of excitement there because we, we have some rain, right? We we do need the rain back in the forecast. We just want to make sure we don't get too much of it at once because. Uh, we're notorious here in South Texas to have that happen. Thankfully, it looks like it's going to be spread out over the week, and we'll have some chances here or there. We'll also have some periods where we won't have rain, so it's not going to be raining all week. But here's a look at where we stand right now. 23.63 inches for the year. That's about half an inch below average, and we're trending drier and drier. So this is... Uh, this is good news to, uh, to have this rain in the forecast outside right now. Some clouds moving through some high clouds, 80 degrees. Dew point is at 67. That makes a big difference. It's quite a bit more humid than what we had been seeing last several days. Calm winds and there is actually a heat index out there. 87 stints and 84 Port SA. You'll notice some of those high clouds are drifting through, so we should still see quite a bit of sun this afternoon, pushing temperatures up to about 90 degrees or so. 84 Creso Springs, 82 in Uvalde, 82 up there in Junction. And the forecast for today takes us up to about 91. We'll call for partly cloudy skies throughout the afternoon. Light winds out of the southeast, 5 to 10 miles per hour. Those dew points are in the 60s and 70s. It feels a lot more humid out there. And this humidity is surging north and northwest. Even parts of West Texas now starting to see more humidity out ahead of our storm system, which right now is sitting out over parts of New Mexico. This is a cutoff low. It means the jet stream is not really pushing this quickly. It's just kind of sitting there for now, and it's helping to generate some showers out across West Texas at this hour. These showers, by the way, don't make it into our neck of the woods today. It's not until tomorrow, I think, that we start to see the effects of this area of low pressure. But uh, San Angelo over towards Midland, they are getting a little bit of rain uh, this morning or this afternoon, I should say. 6 p.m. today, just some cloud cover. There will be some showers and storms potentially out in Mexico. I don't think those work their way into Texas just yet. Tomorrow, though, different story. This is 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Does show some thunderstorms trying to pop up. And then as we get into tomorrow night, I think we're going to get a line of showers and storms developing out west. These move east and could move into San Antonio during the overnight hours late Tuesday night early Wednesday morning. With this, a couple strong storms. We could also see some heavy rain mixed in there. So that'll be something we watch tomorrow night. And then by tomorrow or Wednesday morning, it's starting to move east. Still some lingering showers. I think we probably get a little bit of a break mid midday Wednesday before some more showers and storms start to develop Wednesday afternoon. So here's the rainfall potential. Right now we're thinking one to three inches. And this is through Saturday morning. So this is over uh, five day period. OK, so that that gives us a lot of time to pick up this much rain. But I do think areas north and west of San Antonio could see uh, rainfall in that range, if not a couple places seeing some numbers higher than that. Here are the rain chances. 60 percent chance tomorrow night, 40 percent chance Wednesday, 40 percent chance Wednesday, Thursday. And then I think we have another really good shot of rain Thursday afternoon, Thursday night into Friday. So several shots here to get some rain in the extended forecast. There it is that 60% chance that uh, brings temperatures down just a little bit. Wednesday 89 87 Thursday 84 on Friday with rain around and these rain chances even continue into the weekend. 50% chance Saturday 30% chance Sunday. Quick reminder. Don't forget to download the KSAT weather app. If you want to do it right now, just put the camera on the TV right there on that QR code. 
It'll give you a link to download the KSAT weather app. And don't forget to turn on the notifications. We'll be sending out notifications and updating the forecast often for you this week with the active weather, guys. Very cool. We look forward to that rain. Yep. Thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. Hey, the Spurs are very, very young this year, and Coach Pop is excited to get this season started with all that youth. A live report coming up from Media Day, and the Cowboys finally get to play a home game. They host the Eagles. A preview of that one on the way. For the first time in a couple of years, the Spurs hosting a full-fledged Media Day today, and what a change for the Spurs. No Patty Mills or DeMar DeRozan or Rudy Gay. Just a bunch of young guys ready to hit the floor running, literally. Our Andrew Seeley is at the practice facility, and he joins us now live with the latest from Media Day. Andrew? Yeah, thank you, guys. This year's Spurs squad will be wildly different than what fans are used to seeing. In fact, DeJounte Murray and Derek White are the longest-tenured Spurs on the current roster. Their voices will undoubtedly be louder alongside third-year guard Keldon Johnson, who's fresh off winning an Olympic gold medal, and Lonnie Walker IV. It's not all young faces, though. Manu Ginobili is back in a front office role this season, and Bryn Forbes returns after winning a championship with the Bucks. But with all the new faces, how does head coach Greg Popovich feel about this year's roster? Yeah, and that's exciting to me. Uh, I'm thrilled with this group. Uh, they're basically young, energetic, got a lot of speed. You know, I just talked to them briefly about the fact that uh, there's no need to pace yourself. You know, nobody's going to play 39 minutes a game. Uh, we're not worried about stats or uh, individual honors or anything like that. Uh, these guys are just going to have a ball playing. It's going to be simple, simple, simple stuff. Uh, and at both ends of the court, you know, we just we want a lot of activity, a lot of pace, uh, and just play fast. Now, Pop did confirm that the team is 100% vaccinated. He even got his third booster shot. Time will tell if this youth movement is going to be the shot in the arm the team needs to return to the playoffs for the first time since 2019. From the Spurs practice facility, Andrew Seeley, KSAT 12 Sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Hey, finally, the Cowboys get to play a home game this season. So far, they are 1-1 one one on the road to start the year, but tonight, it's their home opener. Pretty good way to start it, too. The NFC rivals, Philadelphia Eagles in town. The Cowboys gave the defending Super Bowl champs a run for their money in the season opener and then kicked their way to a 2017 victory over the Chargers in L.A. Cowboys are three-and-a-half-point favorites tonight as Dak Prescott continues his road to recovery so far. He has thrown for 640 yards, three touchdowns, and two interceptions to start the season. But is this the last box to check in Prescott's recovery process playing in front of the home crowd for the first time since suffering that season-ending ankle injury last year? Um, all those boxes um, are checked, um, and I think this would just be a, a great one just to get out there. Um, obviously, the last time I played was in front of our, our home crowd, but to just get out there and do it again in AT&T, um, I think it'll be fun. It'll be something that, as, as we said, I'll, I'll take a moment. I won't take any of it for granted, but um, yeah, all the boxes are checked and just ready to go out here and get a win. Need that win box checked. Week three, Cowboys, Eagles, 715 kickoff, AT&T Stadium on ESPN tonight. Hey, the Indy Racing crossed the finish line for the season yesterday in Long Beach with San Antonio's own Pato Award finishing up a great second season for Aero McLaren SP Racing. He claimed two victories this season, including his first at Texas Motor Speedway to go along with his four poles and nine top five finishes. He had a shot at being named the Indy Series champion, but got knocked out of Long Beach through no fault of his own, only to return on lap 53, 34 laps down. A gutsy performance. He was nice enough to join us live from California last night via Zoom following the final race, and we asked him how he thought he did this season. We got one, we got a breakout win. We added another one on top of that. Uh, multiple, multiple time pole sitter, and uh, it's just it's just frustrating. Frustrating that our season had to come to an end like this. But we need to see the positives. We we had a great season. We got our first win. Uh, got another one on top of that, and then multiple time pole sitter. And we had some great fights on track. So I think we should be very proud of what we accomplished this year. And we have uh, lots that we can take into next year and just get better. Competition. Man, congratulations on a great season, by the way. The winner of today's Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach was Colton Herta. And the Indy Series Championship goes to Alex Palo. Palo came in third, just 62 points behind. So congratulations to him. Yeah, congrats.
And taking a look, if you've been looking to get your hands on a new vehicle, today's market is tough. Increased demand and not enough supply has driven prices up, and it may be enough to make you want to keep the car you currently own. Coming up today at 5, 12 on your size, Marilyn Morris shows you where to turn for repairs to keep your car running longer. The White House is taking a new step to protect the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Today, the Department of Homeland Security shared that it is beginning a process to place the policy in the Federal Register. DACA was originally implemented through a Homeland Security memo. This move would recreate the program through formal regulation. DHS will publish the proposed rule tomorrow. The public will then have the chance to comment on it for 60 days. DACA protects undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children, often known as dreamers from deportation. It also gives them certain work authorizations. Customs and Border Protection officials say commercial cargo operations have resumed at the Del Rio Port of Entry. And the Port of Entry was closed back on the 17th due to an influx of thousands of migrants around the International Bridge. Valverde County commissioners told case that the migrants who were camping out in Del Rio were cleared out on Friday, just days after almost 15,000 people, most of them Haitians, were seeking asylum. On Capitol Hill, it's a crucial week for President Biden's agenda and the U.S. economy. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has now pushed back the vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill to Thursday as negotiations over a broader budget bill drag on. Meantime, without action from lawmakers, the government could shut down at the end of this week, while the U.S. couldn't default on its debt next month. ABC's Elizabeth Schultze has the latest from Washington. With a government shutdown and debt crisis looming, a critical week for Democrats in Congress and President Biden's agenda. I'm optimistic about this week. It's going to take the better part of the week, I think. The House is set to vote Thursday on the roughly $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill, which includes funding for roads, bridges, and broadband internet. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi delayed that vote, which she'd initially scheduled for today after pushback from progressives, who insist Democrats' larger $3.5 trillion dollar budget bill must proceed at the same time. I'm never bringing a bill to the floor that doesn't have the votes. The budget bill features funding for universal pre-K, paid maternity leave, free community college, and investments to fight climate change. Facing criticism from moderates about its price tag and scope, Democrats say the package will be paid for by raising taxes on corporations and the highest income earners. It will be paid for, and that's the, the beauty of it. Caught up in the negotiations, two high stakes deadlines for the U.S. government and broader economy. The government will shut down at midnight Friday unless Congress passes a funding bill. And the U.S. risks defaulting on its debt in October without legislation to raise the debt ceiling. Republicans are vowing not to vote to raise the debt limit, setting up an unparalleled scenario where the government wouldn't be able to pay its past bills. This is a totally democratic government. They have an obligation to raise the debt ceiling. Economists say a U.S. debt default would send the economy spiraling back into a severe recession. A government shutdown could furlough federal workers or force them to work without pay, which could be a devastating scenario during the public health response to the pandemic. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. A federal judge says a man who tried to assassinate President Ronald Reagan four decades ago can be released unconditionally from the restrictions he's been living under next year if he remains mentally stable. John Hinckley Jr. was 25 when he attacked the president. Jurors found him not guilty by reason of insanity. Now he's 66 and he's been living in Williamsburg, Virginia since leaving a Washington hospital five years ago. Doctors oversee his medication and therapy. Hinckley's lawyer says he no longer poses a threat. A U.S. district court said that he'll sign off on the plan this week. Now to the latest on the killing of Gabby Petito. Friends and family lined up on Sunday for her funeral. Meanwhile, the manhunt for her boyfriend now enters its second week. Over the weekend, the FBI returned to his family's home. The Laundry family's attorney says agents requested some of Brian's things to assist them with DNA matching. Collective rewards for information leading to Brian's capture now top $30,000. And we have the latest on the deadly Amtrak derailment in Montana. Three people killed, more than 50 were hurt, and two teams of federal investigators have been dispatched. As ABC's Matt Gutman reports, crews still have not moved the train. 
Now, investigators from the NTSB have begun their preliminary investigation into what happened here by trying to preserve what they call the perishable evidence, things like recorders and rail conditions. So the train is actually left exactly as it was at the moment of the crash. It derailed late Saturday, killing three people, wounding over 50, 150 people plus on board as that train traveled from Chicago to Seattle. Obviously, nobody knows at this point what caused that derailment, but people were jolted inside their cars. Uh, they had to break through windows in order to try to get out. The jaws of life had to be used to take some of the passengers out as first responders gathered here from hundreds of miles away. People were in these fields just walking to buses where they were taken to safety. Uh, unclear how long that initial investigation will take place, but about 14 hours after the NTSB completes that initial work, uh, rail workers will be allowed to take those rail cars off and get this crucial rail link moving again. Matt Gutman, ABC News, near Joplin, Montana. Outside with live cam, it's not too bad today, but the good news is changes are on the way. Mm -hmm. We're looking for some rain chances to kick in this week. Not so much today, but starting tomorrow night and then stretching all the way into the weekend. Before we jump into any rain chances, though, do want to start with the tropics. Right now we're watching Hurricane Sam. That really is the main story out in the Atlantic. This was a powerful hurricane, still is, but it's weakened a little bit. Winds are at 125 miles per hour. It's moving northwest at about eight miles per hour. And it's a pretty healthy looking storm here on satellite. We expect that this will stay a major hurricane as it moves north and eventually northeast. It will affect the island of Bermuda. Not a direct hit, but we'll get close enough to where they will have some effects there. Not affecting the U.S. mainland, though, so that's good news there. There's a couple other systems also on the Atlantic that are worth watching. None that uh, are of immediate threat, though. Temperatures 81, Randolph 84, Gonzales 84 down there in Pleasanton 83, and Uvalde 78 still in Lost Maples, but most places in the 80s now. And with more sun, we expect the temperatures to get up near 90 today. Here's what we're watching, this area of low pressure off to the west. You can see it's already sort of spiraling some showers into Texas. West Texas seeing a little bit of activity this morning and this afternoon. Our rain chances again kick up tomorrow, not so much today. We're at 91 this afternoon, partly cloudy. Southeast Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then rain chances look pretty good, especially as we get late into the work week. We'll have another look at that seven day forecast here in just a few minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. September is World Alzheimer's Month, and according to a recent study, dementia cases will triple worldwide by 2050. So what's the reason behind this concerning trend? A lot of developing countries, people are living longer, but we're seeing more diabetes, uh, greater weight gain, more smoking, um, and those risk factors are increasing the, the risk for, for Alzheimer's and related dementias. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. For those unfamiliar, dementia is a term used to describe a group of symptoms that can affect thinking, memory, reasoning, personality, mood, and behavior. Cleveland Clinic's Dr. James Leverance says the results of the study highlight the importance of early intervention, especially among younger people who still have a chance to lose weight, start working out, and quit smoking. He says living a healthy lifestyle can make a big difference. A lot of our research here at the Cleveland Clinic is focused on how physical activity interacts with genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, the immune system. So I think we're very excited about trying to, to parse out what, um, what, what ways that we can recommend people to help prevent them from getting Alzheimer's, even when they carry a risk gene. There is currently no single test available to determine if someone has dementia. Doctors often have to do a series of exams and assessments. The latest Marvel movie led the box office the first three weekends in September. Could it complete a clean sweep for the month? We're going to look at the top five films later in the show. And the healthiest drink is, of course, a glass of water. But if you're looking for something fizzy and fun, should you grab a diet soda? Why, it may not be the best option coming up after the break. So are you a Coca-Cola person or do you go for Diet Coke? The lesser calorie beverage is the better choice, right? Well, the science is in and the results may surprise you. Sarah Costa explains which is better for your body and for your brain. Ah, 
Nothing beats the crisp taste of a soda. But what if the bubbly drink had zero calories and zero sugar? Do you know which is better for you? Uh, I'm diet, but he's regular. Yeah, uh, regular soda. <laughs> you go from 200 calories to no calories. However, there's been some information that shows that actually making that switch doesn't help as much as you think it should. A study by the American Geriatric Society found that diet soda intake was related to increasing abdominal obesity. Also, artificial sweeteners, which are also found in diet soda, were linked to an increase of high calorie food. Something about your brain chemistry recognizes that there's something sweet because of the artificial sweeteners in the soda, and that might actually dial up your craving for more sweets. Researchers from Columbia University and University of Miami found those who consumed diet soda had a 43% higher chance of developing cardiovascular disease than those who drank regular soda. And those who drank as little as one diet beverage a day were three times more likely to develop dementia and had an increased risk for stroke over a 10-year period. Just something to think about before you pop open your next drink. And we all know sodas lead to obesity, which is a pretty common health condition here in San Antonio. According to the CDC, a little over 65% of adults in Bear County are overweight or obese. San Antonio is also ranked at number 17 on the list of fattest cities in America. I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Back to you guys. Well, there goes all the food choices in my cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> the Tootsie Pops and the, the, the good stuff, the M&M's and, &Ms and the, the diet soda. There was a hamburger in there, too. <laughs> well, see that. <laughs> you just got to give it all away at Halloween, David. <laughs> oh, that's so hard. Wow. Don't give it to my kids. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You got, you got to have a little bit of candy on there. Yeah. Uh, 80 degrees uh, so far today. 66 was the low this morning, which is still pretty comfortable. That's right about on average. The record low is 41, said back in 1942. We haven't been anywhere near that. I think temperatures will be pretty close to average today. Then they drop below average later this week because of rain. We'll look in on that prospect coming up. So water. Is important is the drink of choice especially when it <laughs> yes. gets hot and humid like it could today mm -hmm. yeah it's a good choice I mean yeah. you know soda can be your treat maybe yes yeah. sure <laughs> yeah sure. Uh, what water is a good thing thankfully we're getting into the cooler time of year and this week has been pretty good to us at least the last several days the weekend was fantastic we had these cool mornings nice afternoons now we're completely transitioning into a, a, a different weather pattern we are expecting some rainy days ahead Take a look at the lows this morning. They were still pretty nice. 66 here in San Antonio, 62, ran off 61 New Braunfels. But you can start, start to see sort of the transition here. The mornings are getting a little more warmer, a little more humid, and that's what we're going to be dealing with from here on out as humidity really starts to increase. There's the scene outside, just some high clouds moving through right now. 80 degrees at the airport, but up to 87 already. It's dense and really warm down there. 84 Kelly, 81 Randolph, and pretty light winds across the board. 89 in Divine, 84 in New Braunfels, 83 Kerrville. So with these numbers here, you can bet that we'll be close to 90, if not above this afternoon. And it's going to be pretty toasty out there. And we are adding back the humidity today. So there will actually be a little bit of a heat index to contend with. 84 Del Rio, 87 Catula, 87 right now in Kennedy. And the dew point forecast dips a little bit this afternoon. We're still in the muggy territory and then by tonight into tomorrow morning, we're talking about dew points in the 70s and that's when you can really feel it out there. It's going to be sticky. Uh, forecast for today up to 91 by 5 o'clock, 86 by 7 o'clock, down to 78 by 10 o'clock, but not a big cool off overnight tonight into tomorrow morning. Here is our setup. We have high pressure down to our south and southeast and then an area of low pressure over parts of New Mexico. It's already generating some showers across West Texas. Those are falling apart and we do not expect that these will make it into our area today. But we are going to start see, to see some disturbances coming up from the south and west out of Mexico in the coming days and that will kick off rounds of showers and storms. It's not going to be rainy all week, but I think that we'll have some bouts of rain and then clearing out a little bit and then maybe some more storms uh, depending on how this sort of times out. But here's what we're thinking. This is six o'clock today. Not much out there. Maybe some storms out in Mexico. Then as we get into tomorrow, and we'll fast forward to five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. This model does show some thunderstorms popping up 
in any of the thunderstorms that develop, we could see some gusty winds. We're not looking for widespread severe weather, but there could be some stronger storms with some gusty winds. Then we'll put our eyes out west by the evening hours because I think we'll start to see some showers and storms developing junction down the Eagle Pass and then that will develop into a line and work its way east. So by say the midnight to 3 a.m. Wednesday morning, we're dealing with storms potentially here around San Antonio and then those move east by Wednesday morning. We'll start to clear out a little bit, maybe a break and then more storms developing Wednesday afternoon. As far as rainfall goes, one to three inches on average. Look, not everybody's going to get that much rain, but I think it, especially San Antonio along Highway 90 and North, it looks like that would be a, a an average number uh, when we're talking about rainfall here. And this is through Saturday morning, keep in mind. So this is over a long period. We're not anticipating a lot of flood issues, but as we get later in the week, can't rule it out if, if the rain uh, becomes fairly heavy. And here's what our rain chances look like. 60%. Uh, Tuesday night into Wednesday and then Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, about a 40% chance. And then I think there's another window Thursday night and Friday where we have a pretty decent shot and some rain and that'll keep temperatures down quite a bit. 92 tomorrow, 89 Wednesday with those rain chances, 87 Thursday, 84 Friday with a decent chance of showers and storms. And this continues over even into the weekend. Decent shot Saturday and a 30% chance there on Sunday. And once again, we'll remind you Download the case that weather app. We're going to be doing updates pretty uh, pretty often here and we'll keep you updated on everything that's going on. You'll notice there's a QR code there and you can uh, put your camera from your phone on there and it'll give you the link to download the case that weather app. And we may be doing some live broadcasts from there if it warrants if the weather warrants it. And then uh, we'll also be sending out notifications and updates via the KSAT weather app as well. well hold on, hold on. Might be somebody trying to do that right now. Don't That's true. Leave it, it we'll there. Give you some time. <laughs> yes. You know, some of us aren't like real fast at this. Or our phone might not be handy, but well, we'll, I know, we'll I know, keep watching. I know David's tech savvy. He is. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Justin. You got it. We're still waiting. <laughs> The newest Marvel flick proving to be unbeatable at the box office as it takes a four straight weekend title. We'll look at the films rounding out the top five coming up.